So I know I've not made a long video in the past couple of weeks, but with the release of Ableton Live 12, I've been mainly focused on writing a Live 12 course. It's a pretty extensive course I'm in the final stages now of just editing the course down. I've also been teaching other students as well at the same time, so I've just not had a chance to get around to making a long video. But finally, I'm gonna break down a track that I recreated actually a few months ago. And the song is called Swing King by Sesco and Hamdi. Now this song doesn't feature a lot of musical elements, so we're not gonna talk as much about the composition side of things, but we're gonna focus a lot more on the sound design elements. So let's get started just by playing the track. I only really did that short bit of intro just before the drop and the first 16 bars of the drop there. But first of all, let's just quickly get out of the way a lot of the music compositional elements because there aren't too many. First thing is the tempo is 140 beats per minute, pretty standard for any dubstep related song. The key of the track is probably quite a difficult one to work out, but the main bass note that we have in the song is this D sharp here. So we could probably guess it's D sharp minor or some kind of mode, but a lot of the notes jump up and down in between different keys and there's a lot of pitch bend on the bass too. That means it doesn't really live within a key. Now let's look at the drum beat. So here we've got the main kit. And in terms of the pattern, one of the big things about dubstep is that the tempo is always generally 140 beats per minute, but it doesn't actually play at 140 beats per minute as you would normally expect with a house track, for example. Usually dubstep drum patterns are written in half time. So our claps don't land on the second and fourth beats within each bar anymore. They actually land on the third beat, which is just double the length. So you can see here our claps live on 1.3, 2.3, 3.3, etc. Whereas if we were to play this at 140 beats per minute with a regular drum beat, you'd get something that sounds a little bit closer to like a garage drum beat. And as you can hear the difference now between these two, slows the tempo of the track down quite dramatically. Now there are a lot of different hi-hat layers within this track here. We've got one, two, three, four, five. Technically those top two are shakers, but we'll count them in anyway. And we've also got an extra shaker layer just underneath here. And this is just a drum root from Ableton Stock Library, if I remember right, this HH Kit 2 100 shaker loop. And all I've done with this is I just quantized the shaker loop because one of the big things about this song is the swing. The swing we have set on here is the 16th note swing, 67, which is quite high. Now we do have a few drum elements in here that help accentuate certain notes and help give the drum beat this kind of slower feel. One in particular is this hi-hat down here. Whether or not this hi-hat actually exists in the track is quite hard to tell because it could be part of the kick drum sample, but there's one that lands on seemingly every other Beat. So every two beats, you get one of these hi-hats. And it really helps slow down the tempo to that half-time tempo we were talking about before. And we have this off-beat hi-hat in the top here, which you wouldn't necessarily think was off the beat. Usually the off-beat hi-hat would land in between beats one and beats two, beats two or three. But if you think about the beat, not at 140 beats per minute, but again, in this longer half time pattern, that would technically be on the off beat because our clap would technically be on the second beat. And therefore this lands in between the first kick and the clap and so on. And this is providing that slight bounce to the song if we turn this off. And then the one underneath is the swingy one. It's the one that's providing most of the groove if we turn this off. Oh, 
And a lot of those hi-hats focus around the 16th notes in our drum beat, the ones that are gonna be swung like this one here, that one, and that one. Short shaker loop on the top, just two slightly different shakers, one a little bit longer than the other. And then combined with the shaker loop underneath, And one thing to point out about the kick drums is it's a fairly standard pattern for a track like this. And we have some kick drums again that land on those, for example, this is four sixteenth note, which is helping give it some extra swing. It's utilizing the groove that we've added to add some extra groove. If I move this to the off beat, technically in between the two, you can hear the beat sounds a little bit stale, but when it's shifted over to one of those swung notes there. Helps it emphasize that skippy feel. We also have some other elements within our vocal group. This push sample here that was taken directly from the actual reference track. A nice simple rhythm, but again, it's just to help It really helps accentuate the drums and the tempo underneath. And then we also have some other vocals dotted around like this one at the end of the second bar. And another one at the end of the fourth bar. Yeah. Just alternating between them, providing an extra bit of variation to our drum beat. And of course, the pop at the beginning here, which is simply, I just recorded this before. And it's really just used more to emphasize the drop. So let's delve into the bass sounds first of all. And the bass I tried having multiple different layers, which is very common in a genre like this. And a lot of the time you'll have a sub layer and then a mid bass, which will provide more of the character or the grittiness, the distorted part. Actually, after having these three different layers in the song and getting near to the end, I found out that I could just remove them and it sounded pretty much exactly the same. So I've actually only just got the one bass layer here. And the key thing that makes these bass stand out is not necessarily just the sound design, but it's the way they've been programmed. There's a lot of pitch bend that's used on these two bass sounds to make them bend and sound a little bit more dissonant, a little bit darker, add an expression to the sound. And a lot of people look past pitch bend and all these simple programming features and jump into the sound design first, but adding some slight variation with pitch bend can make a massive difference. Now this first bass here, as you can see, there are only really four notes within our pattern here. And these two notes are overlapping on purpose because we're using the legato feature within Serum to add that nice bend between them. We could have used pitch bend for this as well. I thought it'd be a bit more precise using the notes instead. And the bass below contains a lot more of these pitch bends. If we have a look at the notes in here, if we go into envelopes in the top in live 12 here, we're gonna go down to the bottom and go to MIDI control and then pitch bend is just next to it there. And you can see I've added a lot of pitch bend on these notes. And you can see that it's used quite a lot. At the end of our notes, there is this decrease in pitch. There's one here, one on this one, and then one at the end here too. And we also have some movement upwards as well. When you're using pitch bend, it's important to know where the pitch bend parameter is within your synth because you will want to set, if you can at least anyway, the pitch bend amount to a certain number of semitones so that you'll pitch perfectly up to a set note. And looking at these notes here, you can see there isn't really a key that would work with all of these notes because if you can see, we've got the D here, we have a D sharp and an E, which is very, very uncommon in most keys. You'll tend to have two notes that are a semitone apart like this. The next step will generally be two semitones apart. You never normally get three notes in semitone succession after each other. Yeah. 
Let's go back up and let's talk a little bit about sound design. Let's go into our main bass serum here. And I've used serum for both of these bass sounds just because it's widely available. And you could also use Vital as well if you don't have serum for this. Now these synth patches will be in the description so you can download them. And the first thing to really talk about is the rhythm of this bass. The bass has this very fast machine gun like rhythm that does change in the second half over here. Yeah. But overall, you mainly have this fast shape. And this is all being controlled by LFO1. I've got the rate set to 1 over 16th triplet notes. In order to get triplets, you just need to make sure the trip button is turned on down here at the bottom. And that 16th triplet note length is giving a very nice contrast to our simple drum beat at the top, helping it stand out more. I've also got the trigger setting turned on with, of course, make sure you have BPM turned on too. And the shape of the LFO, I didn't have it exactly halfway. This is just a regular triangle way of shape, but it's not at that halfway point. It's actually just slightly early in the LFO sequence, providing a faster increase at the beginning and then a slower decay at the end. And that was just through trial and error, really. That sounded the best to me. This is used pretty much everywhere in this serum patch. You can see it's being used on our oscillator B's volume here to make that wobbling effect. It's also being used on the filter cutoff over here too. And there's some other areas in the effects section as well that this is being utilized. And the rate of this LFO is automated when we get to this section over here. You'll see it drops. Yeah to half that speed to one over eight triplet notes instead. And this is also the same rhythm that is in the beginning in our intro. So let's talk a little bit more about the oscillators now. Our oscillator A is set to this square wave, this basic mini square wave, but you can see it's kind of half square wave and it has a little element of like a saw shape in there too. So it's not exactly a perfect square wave. The more interesting oscillator is of course, oscillator B here. Now I've picked the wave table called harmonic series, which is probably my favorite wave table out of all the wave tables that come with Serum. And this wave table just gives you all the harmonics for the note that is being played. And each number on the wave table position here will give you that specific harmonic. So this is the 12th harmonic. This is picked specifically because it makes this sound in our bass. If we were to move this up and down though, you'll hear it generates loads of different interesting tones. Now a lot of the time the harmonics from about one up to six are generally quite nice and can have a lot of musical qualities as well. When you go above six, normally multiples of those one to six sound good. So for example, six times two is 12. That's why we ended up on our 12th one there. Five times two would be 10. That can also sound quite nice. But some of the other numbers, for example, seven and nine, don't always necessarily sound that good because they aren't a multiple of a lower harmonic. They can sound quite dissonant, whereas we go down here to six, five. This is really the core of this sound, providing the extra tone and that perceived pitch that we get from our bass. Now, the interesting thing about this, as you might be able to see, is that on oscillator B, you've got the fine tune set to minus 40. And minus 40 cents is quite a lot of detuning. I usually recommend only going to about minus 30 and anything beyond that starts to become too dissonant and out of tune. And it's just from creating the sound, I found that when we had it set to this 12th harmonic with no tuning at all, it didn't sound right. It actually sounded too in tune. So I ended up bringing it down to minus 40 where it fit a little bit better with our track. And the one thing I think that could be responsible for this is that speed of movement, that fast LFO. Because if we assign this to our filter over here, which we have done a very small amount, but having very, very quick movement on a filter, especially when there's quite a large range going from low to high in a very short space of time, you can start to get quite dramatic phase shift with the frequencies that you are cutting and then opening up again. And this phase shift can sometimes sound like detuning. You can do this yourself if you play a note in Serum and start to move this phase dial up and down, you'll start to hear the pitch bend up and down. As I said just then, I've got the filter turned on a low pass 18 and I've only got it set to oscillator A here and that's just removing some of the high frequencies in our square.
Now I could have used a sine wave for this side, but I did want to have some harmonics in that low part of my bass sound. You can see this is our first harmonic here, the fundamental. We do have these two harmonics here, which are created by the square wave. And without that, it would just sound a little bit empty in that space there. As you said before, we've got the voicing section set to mono and legato as well. And we've got the portamento turned up to 420 milliseconds roughly there. And we've not got anything else really going on on this front page. The volume envelope is just a default serum envelope. We've not got anything on envelope two or three or anything on LFO2 as well. So let's move into our effects tab then. Inside here, we've got the hyper dimension turned on, not using the dimension on the right hand side that's set to zero on the mix, but the hyper is turned on a little bit just to give some stereo width. I've got the compressor turned on in multiband mode here. And I've actually got this turned on before our distortion. And this should hopefully give us a more controlled distortion afterwards. If we swap them over. Then the compressor is going to be lifting up those high frequencies created by the distortion. But I didn't really want that. I just wanted the distortion to act more evenly across our note. And I didn't end up using the chorus in here. And I did use the filter at the end just to tame some of the high frequencies. And you can see I've got LFO1 assigned to the cutoff there on a very small low pass six filter though. We are bringing the cutoff up and down very quickly, but I've also used LFO1 on the level control on the right here. And normally when you load in one of these effects, it will say mix on the bottom here until you just click on it and it will change to a level. And the reason you want to do this is because it can provide a great amount of control just at the end of your effects chain. If you add in things like the multiband compressor and the distortion unit, you might find that your sound won't be as dynamic as it was before those, just because those two plugins flatten out a lot of the different volume changes in your song. Then it's essentially just bringing the volume up and down, giving our sound that final little bit of control before we add some other effects afterwards. And there's a lot of these type of sounds being used at the moment in other genres like drum and bass too. And the way they work, if we turn the distortion off, you'll hear, this is what it sounds like before. A pretty simple sound overall. If you look at this in Pro-Q3 here, it doesn't look very fancy at all, but the key is when we add the distortion, the bottom end of our square wave and that 12th harmonic, those two peaks interact dramatically when we add distortion, heavy distortion on the top of them. Creating that nasty, gritty bass sound. And outside of Serum, I have an OTT on after this as well. The depth set quite low, 22%. Don't want it to do too much, really just using it to bring up some of the high and mid frequencies. And then after this, I've added a very short reverb. Now I've used Convolution Reverb Pro here in Ableton, and it has this incredibly short impulse response. And if you just play this with 100% wet, barely even a reverb really. But it's adding some extra grit, also a little bit wider too overall. And if you don't have a convolution reverb plugin like this, you can just use a reverb with a very, very short decay time. But there are also free convolution reverb plugins out there. Of course, there's this one inside of Ableton and there is Space Designer inside of Logic Pro that have some very short reverb and impulse responses in them, but there are also some out there online that you can download too. And importantly on this reverb, it's taken out a lot of the low end, as you can see. And these two plugins over on the right, the auto filter and the utility are just used for automation. They're just used for the beginning section. So if we go over to the left here, This auto filter is just used to thin out the bottom end of this bass in the intro section. And the utility I used as a little bit of a fade in. I just used the utility to fade that beginning in and the end out a little bit too.
Now that's all there is on this track here, but again, as I said before, I did have this set into a group. I've got an LFO tool set up. Now I use LFO tool just because I have it, but there's Kickstart 2 out there. And there also are some ways you can do this inside of Ableton as well. You want a sidechain plugin like this because they're a lot more accurate than regular sidechain compression. And you can also trigger them using a MIDI note instead of an audio signal, which is always gonna make them more precise. And I've got my kick drum that triggers this. And then the last plugin I have on here is a Kilo Hearts Tape Stop plugin, which is just creating our bend in the second half here. And I've just automated that on and off. <laughs> 